So I think that that's really what we have to get over. My sense is the first step in overcoming the threat of global warming is to just talk about it. And so I think we want to get people who are eager and willing to actually influence the outcome of it and to become engaged and to even stick their neck out of the hole long enough to let other people know that this is an issue for them and that they want to have something to say about whether or not humankind survives. Welcome to Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Regina and I'm your host and our topic today, become an influencer. And spearheading that discussion is our special guest, Meta Spencer. Not only is her name spectacular, but so is her life's work. Meta completed her PhD from UC Berkeley in California and went on to be a professor of sociology at the University of Toronto Arendale's College in 1971. She taught regularly at the university's Peace and Conflict Studies program, which she founded in 1989. And she coordinated this department until her recent retirement in 1997. Now, when you think of Meta, it is not the Facebook Meta that drives so much conflict in our world. No, it's the Meta with two Ts, which in Holly means roughly loving kindness. And I think that she embodies this quite well. And I'm really looking forward to your idea of becoming a climate influencer and why it's so important. And I really do believe that it is quite important, but I'm wondering why you think it's important. Will you please share your thoughts with this on this topic, Metta? Thank you. Well, okay. Uh, I don't know where to start because I'm 92 years old and I don't think you want the whole story. But let's go back about five or six years ago when I was given an award. See, I've been a peace activist most of my life, longer than anything else. I got an award and I had to give a speech and I didn't know what to say, except that I believe that it's important for us to look at systemic problems, that there's not just one problem in the world. We There are at least six or eight, any one of which could wipe out a, a billion people. And, you know, under certain circumstances. And the thing is, they're all kind of interdependent in various ways. You can't solve any one of them without making some progress on at least one of the others. And so uh, that was the point I made, that we need to become more comprehensive. We need to look at how all of the global threats that face humankind are interdependent and see that we're all on the same team, even though we're working in separate silos whether we're working on famine or cyber risks or, uh, you know, uh, pandemics or war and weapons, which is what I've been doing most of my time, or now, of course, global warming, which I I would say those two, uh, war and global warming or climate change, are the two top th- threats to humankind now. So uh, I started a thing called How to Save the World in a Hurry at the University of Toronto, where I was uh, at that point the uh, president of Science for Peace. And we had a two-day conference. We had about 100 people attend. They had to pay. Our speakers on the first day all talked about the various global threats. They were all eminent people. On the second day, we had breakout groups that came up with a platform, which we thought these 25 proposals, if we implemented them all, would really go very far towards solving all these global problems and and protecting us. We came up with this platform for survival. And then I thought, okay, we need to have an organization to to look at all of these comprehensively and try to promote the platform. So we created Project Save the World. And that was um, in 2018. We needed to have a website where people could come and share their ideas with comment columns and discussions, you know, like an old-fashioned listserv. And we have events listings and other things that people can learn what's going on. We also uh, expect people to share ideas. And and then I I figured, okay, 
I just discovered that YouTube had something where you could own your own TV channel. <laughs> do you know that? I mean, in a way you do. And so I started broadcasting conversations that I had with various global experts on these six main global threats that I thought were most important, threatening. So, you know, for several years, four years maybe, I did five of these shows every week. Uh, every weekday, I would do a one hour long conversation with, and it was the most, it, you know, during the COVID thing, everybody was trapped at home and I was too, but I just loved it because I had at the best social life anybody could have, you know, every day I would have a conversation with some global expert or sometimes four or five global experts in various parts of the world sitting in their bedrooms or their kitchen table or wherever, and we would have these really good conversations. So I have by now made 592 of those uh, conversations, uh, about an hour long each. And so we put them up on YouTube and we put them up on our website. Now, I mean, I'm sort of tapering off on, on that, but I have a new idea. And, and that new idea is that I think the real important thing is, the amazing thing is exactly what Greta, what's her name, this lovely girl in Sweden, I, I, the girl who says, you know, I couldn't believe that we'd be so so close to such a catastrophe for humankind and people don't talk about it. People act like they, there, there's nothing going on. And she thought it's not possible. Well, it's the way really people are. They don't want to talk about it. So I think that that's really what we have to get over. My sense is the first step in overcoming the threat of global warming is to just talk about it. And so I think we want to get people who are eager and willing to actually influence the outcome of it and to become engaged and to even stick their neck out of the hole long enough to let other people know that this is an issue for them and that they want to have something to say about whether or not humankind survives. So here's an opportunity that occurred to me recently. I want to teach a course that's global in scope about how to become an influencer of climate. Not just one course, a whole bunch of courses. And that I think it, how would you do that? Well, of course you got the internet. And there are these organizations that uh, give courses. I'm gonna start off if possible on something called Udemy because they'll let you do a free one and they don't have too many hoops for you to jump through if you're doing a free course. I've made up this little course with five uh, lessons, and it would take a student about 11 hours to complete the whole thing. Doing field work and assignments out in the community and things like that, as well as listening to excerpts from the 592 <laughs> shows that I've made. So I've taken uh, five of my shows and I've clipped them and made them 20 minutes long, and that is a lecture. And every, every time we change the subject, there's a gong that rings. And you're supposed to write down any words you didn't understand if you're a student and go look them up because you need to understand things. So the notion is, this is a course to get people out of their shells and actually expressing what I think people feel, which is scared out of our wits about what's happening. And well, let's do something about it. And so I have assignments of ways in which people can work together in the community to promote just one of the possible solutions to this. The real way, of course, is everybody knows we have to reduce carbon emissions. But the point is that that's not enough anymore. And people have only just beginning to come around to realizing that's not quite enough. Maybe we better do something more. And then they talk about, oh, don't tell anybody that we that there are other things that you could do. You know, you could. There's geoengineering. You could do something like that. But you don't want anybody to know that because they might think, well, well now we can go ahead and emit all the carbon we want. Well, I think some of the fossil fuel companies talk that way. They would like to get away with it. But I don't think ordinary people are fooled. I mean, every normal person understands 
that, for example, when your bathtub is about to overflow, you both turn off the tap and pull out the plug. And there's no contradiction. And you don't have to ask which one to do first or which one's more important. You got to do both. It's just a matter of, of, of getting people comfortable with the idea of bringing up the subject among friends of theirs who just would never talk about it otherwise. So what I want to do is encourage people to do what you guys are doing. You know, you put on the show just to start a conversation and get, get people in, engaged with it. I taught as a professor of sociology in the Mississauga campus of University of Toronto and then decided we need to have a peace and conflict studies program. So I got approval to do that. And I'm at, I ran it for, I think, 13 years until I retired. But uh, along early on, uh, I started Peace Magazine and have been running that for 40 years. So it's now uh, available on online. Uh, people can subscribe as individuals through uh, Press Reader. It's in Vancouver. But it, I send it out to organizations free of charge, big, anybody who's really working on these six global threats. And we try to cover most of the issues that our experts discuss in these forums that I run. And we'll continue to keep running for a while. So Meta, I'm just curious, Have I, I may have missed it, but are you able to enumerate each of the six global threats that we're currently oh, facing? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's war and weapons, which is what I've been doing 40, well, 50 more years. Uh, then, of course, we call it global warming because that's really what it is, but everybody else says climate change. Uh, then there's famine uh, and there's pandemics. And, of course, famine and pandemics go together because people don't normally die of the disease or of starvation. They, they, or rather, they, they do die of the disease if they get, if they get hungry. They, it's, it's a disease that will carry them off. And then we have uh, cyber risks and we have radioactive contamination, places, things like Chernobyl or Fukushima or even mining um, uranium. Uh, there are ways in which we are exposed and can be gravely exposed to uh, radiation. At the, so that's a serious one. And now, of course, we've got the cyber thing, which has always been there, but it's sort of in the background until... I mean, we've talked about fishing and and all these other crooked things that go on or cyber war a little bit. But really, the big threat now, of course, is AI. That's part of it. So in addition to these six global threats, we have three things that we call policy sectors. That is, we talk sometimes about the economy. We talk about governance, which I, I include uh, human rights issues in the issues of, of governance. And then we talk about civil society, all the other, you know, NGOs and, and work that goes on in in that domain outside of government, government or the economy. So though it's really it's kind of nine different categories that we try to cover, but the six of them are, are real global threats that we consider lethal, you know, existential threats to humankind. Thank you so much for explaining that to us and uh, to our audience, Meta. Very much appreciated. I'd like to turn it over to Peter and uh, see what he has to say about what you just shared with us. Thanks very much, Netta, for um, uh, being here and having a discussion with us. And um, as uh, as Regina has indicated, um, uh, you've done a, a lot of great work over a lot of years. And it's fascinating to hear that now you become interested in in the contemporary uh, issue of influences. So if you don't mind, I'm going to seize the opportunity to mention some names mm -hmm. of uh, who I think have been, uh, and obviously I'm sure we're talking about positive influences here. I mean, there's not a lot of neg negative influencing out there. Um, to uh, mention um, some people, some names who I think have been the best influences with respect to the issue of global warming and climate change. Firstly, being an influencer for climate change is not an easy road to hope. And that's because of the uh, campaign of climate deniers who are out there as bad, if not worse, than ever. So it's, a, it's not an easy thing to take on. 
I do want to mention a great influencer um, who left us a couple of years ago. That's uh, Stuart Scott. And it was largely through Stuart Scott's great, great work, incredibly great work on uh, climate change that we got together. And um, uh, we really enjoy our little sessions doing a climate emergency forum here. So thank you to that. Well, I guess Al Gore, obviously, and he's still very active. He's still a class communicator. He's got to be one of the best communicators in the world. So thank you to Al Gore. Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I recently watched a, a video on his life, and he has become very, very active for a number of years and, and using his, uh, his big influence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the more you look into his life, the more you realize he's really done a lot of climate change. Um, we, we had a great interview, uh, interview yesterday with Professor Elliot Jacobson. And um, he soared in the past couple of years to become um, a really, really good influencer on uh, Facebook and, and, and particularly Twitter. So he's great. Other people, George Monbiot, mm -hmm. you know, he's been in there on climate change for years and years and years. Wonderful, wonderful articles on climate change. And he's a very, very, very clever individual. And he is a good communicator. Greta Thunberg, you've already mentioned. And of course, she's got to be right up there. Uh, as a climate communicator, and um, we need a lot more young people as influencers. Leonardo DiCaprio, have to mention. Finally, on my list here, last but by no means least, is um, uh, a superb communicator who's worked worked hard, very, very constructively, to make himself into one of the best communicators on climate change right now around, and that's my friend and colleague Paul Beckwith. Paul combines the knowledge of the science with the desire and motivation um, to communicate the science and the problems and the issues and the solutions. Here, here. Add my endorsement to that idea. <laughs> Paul's great. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> obviously, he is a good communicator and influencer yeah. then. There's, there's the evidence. But the other thing that fascinates me about Paul is he's so slick with the videos that he does. I mean, they're right up there with the best of, of, you know, short videos and longer videos, and he's got a great following, so it's huge. Particularly, uh, thank you, Paul, for all the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you, Paul. Paul's been on my uh, forums. Yeah, and, well, and well, thank great. you. I'm, I'm very humbled, uh, Peter. I didn't expect that. I thought you might <laughs> um, include yourself at, at the end there because you deserve as much... Um, recognition and of course Meta for her incredible work and Regina and uh, Charles and Heidi who have been mostly behind the scenes but it's good that Charles is doing a bit of moderating and you know we've all uh, attended the uh, climate conferences the cops and as as Peter said it was really Stuart Scott who started it all and got us all together so thank you uh, everybody I want to ask you a couple uh, questions matter. The first one is, I've only ever known you as an interviewer, and I've been on your show a number of times, but I haven't seen it when you're an interviewee, as you are on this program. Are you are you interviewed by many people? I mean, it, you've got a mm -hmm. wonderful story. I mean, it could make a book, it could make a documentary movie. You know, you could have a, the proverbial rocking chair on, on the porch, right? Um, <laughs> You know, but you're you're just you're, you're so motivated and gung ho and you're always thinking of new ideas. And, and it's just, you know, it's, it's just wonderful that you're doing all of this. Thank you. Every now and then somebody wants to hear my story and then I have to make it up all over again because I forget. In the meantime. <laughs> you know, you're mostly on the other side of, of the interview interviewee situation. I don't even call it interviews. When I get in, yeah. there, I get, an interviewer is a nice person who doesn't argue. But if I see <laughs> something that I think is fishy, yeah, I will I will take it up and say you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's really important to advance the knowledge to yeah. to question what what people Absolutely. say. You mentioned people don't want to talk about climate. You know, we have to get over this. Um, I'll give you an, an a, a example. Ottawa, you know, the last few days is 16, 17 degrees Celsius. The mean temperature for this time of year, early March, is about zero. So we're about, 
you know, we're hitting temperatures 16, 17 degrees above usual. People are out in shorts. People are all in good moods because the sun's out. It's super warm. Yet there's a problem here and it's early March. And so people tend to be very resilient and get used to, used to very quickly experiencing mm -hmm. things. And this is a problem because it means that we don't address problems, right? We just see this as, oh, it's a beautiful day out. So how do we get people to actually get concerned over this? I guess that's the, the key part of what you're expressing in your course. Is that right? There's a guy I interviewed who's, I think, a professor in Denmark or someplace. I can't remember his name. But his specialty, as he described it, is looking at the difference between slow-moving crises and fast-moving crises. If there's a uh, run on the bank, or if there's an explosion, or if there's something cataclysmic that happens, even, for example, an election where it's clearly it was fraudulent, there's an event, and it's happened, and people will come out, they'll react very fast. But, you know, the boiling frog idea that if you gradually increase the problem and it just is getting worse over a year, there's no moment when you can mobilize people. And that is a problem. I mean, we got to think up some crises. I, you know, we have yeah. to invent some way of, of saying this is a moment when there's some particular event that absolutely this is the moment when you've got to take to the streets or you've got to yeah. you know do something yeah and i mean you mentioned also that people are scared out of their wits about it many people and they're keeping that hidden inside them i mean i was having a coffee at my local cafe and this these two people were talking about i wasn't listening but i heard the words climate change so i kind of listened a little bit and one one gentleman was saying that his wife who's a, a teacher a grade school teacher is very, very concerned about climate change, about the, you know, what's happening. And she's seeing a counselor to try to work through some of her feelings because she just looks around and doesn't see anybody paying any attention. Climate anxiety is a big thing. And of course, we know that action is the best antidote. But then there's the question of, do I have kids or do I not have kids? I mean, they've just, they have a one-year-old baby. And, you know, so she's probably sleep deprived as well, which is adding to her anxiety, I'm sure. But you know, temperatures, you know, the, the, the weather patterns, you don't have to look very far to see how, how crazy they are. My last question is, you know, do you have some techniques that you use to stay motivated, to keep up good spirits? What's, what makes you tick with all your work? I'm not sure that I can teach other people how to tick. In other words, uh, this is going to be kind of an experiment for me, too, to see whether or not if I interact with what they call learners, not students, if I interact with them, that maybe I can help see where they're, they're hung up. But I tell you one thing that I think may make a difference, but I can't communicate it to other people. And that is, most people say, you've got to have hope, that you, you've got to keep people believing that everything's going to turn out all right, or at least there's very strong chance that it'll be fine. Or else people can't be motivated. They'll they'll quit. They as soon as they lose hope, that's you you've lost their activity. I don't work out of hope. I mean, my energy doesn't come out of hope. It comes out of duty. I think in India they call it dharma. <laughs> if I know that there's something I should be doing, and I think the odds are very small that it's going to work, but that's the best thing I know that I should be doing. I hope to God I have the courage to go ahead and do it. And if it doesn't work, then okay, it doesn't work. But I will have tried my best and I will try to stick through it. I don't want to go around preaching against hope, you know, tell people you don't really need hope. But in a way, psychologically for me, that is the truth. I think that if I depended on believing that everything was going to be fine, I would have quit. But it, believing that I, I should do what I can, even if it's not going to work, I can I can live with that. And I don't I don't get very discouraged. Do you get discouraged? I some of my friends say they get you know some bad news happens and they just say it's so downcast. And I I don't. Do you, Paul? Not about climate. 
right? Because I do so much of it. But sometimes about other things going on in my life, you know, ill relatives or things. But, you know, I, I have to just, you know, get out in nature, you know, go for long walks. You know, having a puppy who's now two years old, you know, re really helps. I mean, we just have to find ways to keep plowing mm -hmm. through. But I love I love the idea of sense of duty because go back to wartime, you know, people really had a sense of duty. You know, I've got to grow my victory garden. I've got to, mm -hmm. you know, skimp and save and not eat so much mm -hmm. for my country, right? Sense of duty. Sense of duty for the planet is, I think, much more nobler than sense of duty for a, a country. It's too much sense of duty for one country, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that leads to wars, et cetera. And that's, you know, of course, horrible. So we need mm -hmm. sense of duty to to planet and to ecosystems mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And I think that's what, what you're really talking about. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you for all you contribute, Bob. So uh, Meta, for those people who do have a hard time keeping hope alive, believing that there's something that they're going to work towards that's actually going to effectuate positive change. Um, because there, I, I think there's probably more people that are um, despondent than those who are hopeful. What would you say to those who are having such a hard time? Do, do you mean I can give them some reason to be hopeful? Because, of course, there are plenty of reasons. I don't know whether that's your question, but I'll answer that one anyway. And, and that is that I think if we just depended on the official line now, which is carbon emissions, that's all you need to think about, just get down to zero carbon emissions or, you know, net zero, then everything will work out. Well, that's that's a lie. And, and we know it's a lie and they are continuing to tell it and, and it's not helping anybody. But what you need to do is to say, well, of course, we want to do emission reduction, obviously, but that's not enough. You've got to do more. And yeah, there are a lot of good things that can be done. And for example, this little test I'm doing to see if I can produce a, a course with five lessons, that's going to be about enhanced rock weathering, how you can take rocks and smash them and put it on the fields. That's not even controversial. The, you know, nobody... I mean, nobody knows how much we can get uh, of the CO2 out of the atmosphere that way. But it's clear that we can, that that's why nature does it. And, and we can do to some extent, too. And it also is pretty clear it doesn't do any harm unless, in fact, you do stupid things like, you know, carry your rocks too far. And the transportation is, you know, how you, you know, emit more carbon than, than you've saved. So you, you can do it wrong. But if you use common sense and and uh, readily available information, you can make a difference with just smashing rocks and spreading them. You know, tell people that whatever whatever you want to do, do something real that will make some difference, and get out there and talk about it. That's I think the important thing is get people saying, bring up the subject yeah. in your dinner table. For example, if you go out with a clipboard into the mall and you make up a, a petition and get people to sign it. Now, the reality is that's probably not going to do much. I don't, I don't even pretend that that's going to change government policy on climate change or something. But what it will do is it's good for you, you know, get you out there and not scared to, to say, hey, fella, can, can you come here a minute? Let me ask you to sign this petition. And you get into a conversation that way. So that does good to the person in becoming an influencer, because you can influence the people you know, you can influence the people in your shopping mall, and maybe you can get on uh, somebody's TV show, or you can get to be my uh, role right now, influencing everybody. Look how many people I'm influencing. <laughs> okay. Does that answer you? I don't know whether I answer your question. Yeah, that does. Any action is better than no action. And we can't really know the results of our actions. You know, they can spread far and wide and we're not, we shouldn't cut off action just because we think that it won't do any good because we have no idea how good our actions will do. So yeah, I like that's a great answer. Getting back to duty versus hope. That's probably how I think as well when I, when I think about it. It's not hope 
that drives me because when you have hope, you're expecting, you're hoping for some result, mm -hmm. right? And it's very hard to, to, to do all this work that we're doing and you've been doing on, you know, peace for years and years and years if you are expecting some sort of result. So I think, you know, doing what we do and not expecting a result, not not looking for a result, I think that's one of the keys to staying motivated and how you've been able to do do your work. Because if it was just on the result, okay, there's never going to be peace in the world completely, right? I mean, look at the conflicts that we have now. And, you know, so if you were tied to a result, you know, you'd be kind of devastated by today, what's going on today. And that's then... true as far as motivation goes. But, you know, I wouldn't want to talk about it completely as if you don't really have to think about the consequences of what you're doing just do anything and uh, you know we don't want to say that either no no we don't Clearly, what we do it has to be done with the motivation of trying to find a strategically sensible crack in the system that we can put our wedge and make some difference and so we got to look practically and re realistically at at what the opportunities are. And, you know, people are not always in a position to have uh, a chance to make a difference. And and in a way, I think we could be really grateful that we live in a single moment in history when a single person could actually save the world. There are cases, for example, this guy Stanislav Petrov, in, uh, this Russian guy who literally saved the world, you know, there would have been a nuclear war if he had done what his orders required of him and he just didn't do it. So, you know, we're in a position now where all kinds of people can make some difference and not nobody can, or only Stanislav Petrov, very, not many other people could make that enormous difference that you could say is the difference between war and peace, but, but even where you are, there's generally some opportunity and you just have to be looking for it to find. And I think that means you have to know some stuff. And that means you have to learn, you have to listen to Paul Beckwith's videos. <laughs> and climate emergency forums videos, right? Yeah. I like that word, you know, we have to actually act as if we really mean it. That yeah. it's an emergency. So um, I, I, I guess I'd like to jump in and, and thank you, Meta. Your words were music to my ears. Um, I agree that hope is not a great motivator. In fact, the way that it's been presented for climate change, you know, and we need emergency action, uh, you could say it's a demotivator. And I want to thank you also for sharing that your motivation is duty. And um, Paul made some excellent uh, uh, remarks on that. And... When you said that, my, my mind went to actually some religions and uh, some of the Eastern religions and, and the uh, uh, people in, uh, in India. I've experienced that uh, they have a huge sense of duty that it seems our culture, I, I don't really think, has. And, and I'm also reminded, of course, of, of the Buddhist religion there, right? because their belief and um, encouragement for people to consider what is right in the world and then to act on what they everybody intuitively knows what is right in the world. So, you know, the right action, the right belief, okay. Those, those are big influences too. Sure, religion has been negative influence over. And um, Paul, what you were talking about, um, don't think about the result. Pure, pure Gandhi. Pure Gandhi, mm -hmm. yeah. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. The, the Gita. <laughs> Sometimes I, I couldn't always understand the Gita, frankly. But then, <laughs> that's another conversation. Now, you mentioned uh, two courses, Meta. So the one course is on, on more on the how to be an influencer, a climate influencer. Is the other one along the same lines? or? Well, it doesn't exist yet, and none of them exist. So I'm I'm talking yeah. prematurely. I'm, I'm talking about hope and not, not realism at the moment. But... <laughs> Uh, I expect that I, I don't think the odds are too bad that I'll get this course on how to be a, an influencer or encouragement to be an influencer. But last year, I ran a series of talk shows uh, about uh, four different, I guess you could say, geoengineering uh, innovations. Some of them wouldn't be normally called geoengineering. Uh, four different ways in which we could actually make a difference with, with the climate. 
Uh, one is the one I've just mentioned, the enhanced rock weathering or the use of soil amendments, such as including uh, seaweed and uh, biochar, uh, because that, that has many advantages. And really, I don't know of any disadvantages, except you might, you know, spend too much of your um, carbon emission budget on, on doing it. A second one would be negative concrete, negative carbon negative concrete. And I've had some conversations lately with people who think that there is no such thing, but I've, it depends on your definition. I think it is. And there is a guy in California who's got this thing called Blue Planet, which I think produces uh, concrete that is actually absorbs a lot of uh, CO2 from the atmosphere or locks it up permanently. Um, and then there's urban forestry, and it's going to be a while before any trees that we plant now will be doing much of anything to to reduce uh, CO two from the air. But it can pretty soon a tree can start shading things in the city and making uh, our lives more comfortable. And then finally, uh, we were looking at ways of chilling the Arctic, or if possible, even refreezing the Arctic with uh, either marine cloud brightening or ocean iron fertilization or uh, maybe cirrus cloud uh, thinning um, or something like that. Um, and so uh, we, uh, the Pugwash group, which I belong to for 40 years or so, uh, has uh, gone together with, with me in putting on these shows and we had about 25 shows on these subjects. And then they are going to be taking the reports from these conversations and lobbying uh, in Ottawa with the Ministry of Environment and Climate to promote all four of these. Now I decided to move forward with just the Arctic because I think the Arctic is, to me, the scary part, the scariest. It could be, you know, a big uh, methane explosion from the bottom of the Arctic Ocean and and it might be curtains right there. So I want to continue this, this search for technologies that could reduce uh, the threat of global warming, especially in the Arctic. And we have 35 shows lined up this time. I'm inviting experts for each of them. And uh, so uh, I will be making potentially, if all goes really well, I'll make all 35 of them into a course. Well, Meta, it's been wonderful having you today. I've certainly learned a lot and I understand completely, you know, we cannot be driven just by hope. Let's do what we can, right? And and know that action precedes results, always. And of course, the first action is the one that starts in the mind. So we have to have as Peter said, right thinking, right action, all of these things are like a seed that will bloom in the right direction. And, and that's what we want. And that's what we need. One of the ways that you can begin right action is to give us a thumbs up and to share this video with someone who may learn from it. And then perhaps they will share it with someone else. Keep that river going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I know that we mentioned a few climate influencers. One that actually uh, was off the list was uh, Jane Fonda. I believe that she has, I think it's called Fire Drill Friday or something like that. But whatever influencers that we did not mention, please let us know in your comments so that we can add them to the list. Share with us who you think is an admirable climate influencer. That would be really, really helpful for our discussion. And I want to thank you all for being here with us. And I cannot wait to see you next time at the Climate Emergency Forum.